I did Club Award Weekend Raps. Club Award is the first private TV private station. Private TV station, mm -hmm. yes, Nigeria. I remember that. Jimmy was there, and then there were no producers, right? Yes. So most of the rappers that come through don't what they're rapping on. They're rapping on instrumentals. One of the first guys that came through in the first time, and he came through hardcore with his crew from Ajegunle, and he was ready. Yeah, and he yeah. shook it. He used to be a rapper. Yeah, no, no, he was, he was a rapper. He came that day as a rapper. Fresh, busy crew, FBC. Fresh, yeah. busy crew. Yeah, from Ajegunle City. And Shoki was rapping and going off, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, who's this guy, man? The energy was just yeah. heavy, but it wasn't quite working. And I remember talking to him, and I was like, bro, man, I think maybe you're a dancehall artist. You know, maybe tweak this thing. And I didn't see him for two years. When I saw him two years later, now he's the daddy Shoki that you, you know yeah. now. He had found himself, right? And he was ready to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello. Ah, you are leaving me hanging. <laughs> it's okay. This is now the Chinaza Onuzo podcast. Indeed. Welcome to Inkblot Meet and Greet, starring Chinaza Onuzo. I never, you can never be starring when I'm here. by Chinaza Onuzo. Written by Not Chinaza possible. Onuzo, right? And with a couple impossible. of people that just happen to show up and a man that needs no introduction. Mm. And Indeed. He, Remember what Ibrahim said last time, that when you say, this man needs no introduction, it's because you forgot to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, He's a type of bio. <laughs> like, no. So, I mean, so when um, Zulu said that uh, Obi Asika was coming on the show, and she was, I, and I was like, at least we know we will, not have, we, will run, we will never run out of things to talk about. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, because so. literally a giant of the basically media and entertainment, entertainment space, space. Mm -hmm. straddled the Nigerian entertainment space like a colossus. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, music, that's, that's like Nigerian English. <laughs> music, <laughs> music, TV, reality show. Yes, you still enter film, There's but, but let, let, but let, we're, we're coming to film when they allow us. When they allow us, when they allow us. Gatekeepers, keep him out. Lock the gate, hold the door, hold the door. Biko, But So we're very, very excited that he decided to do this. Um, Zulu ambushed him. She a, yes. set up, man. She implied that it was just her and him talking, and then he showed up and met my mm. amazing self and this one, you know. Wow. So, uh, so, so this is how it goes down. So we are, show. we are ready, locked and loaded, right? And he has threatened to ask us any questions, but we won't answer because it is all about him. And yes. we want to spend a lot of time basically drinking from the well of knowledge. Oh, hey. fountain. Wow. Yes. Hey. Welcome to the show. Thank you, man. Thank so you. So be a seeker. Thank In case you. people were still sleeping on your... You've met my egotistical partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's shy. <laughs> yeah, he's a very shy guy. Yeah, yeah. Shrinking violet almost, you know. Oh, yeah. So for a lot of people, when you mention Obi Asika, one of the first things that comes to mind, it also depends on which year, right? So if you're like... Which year you mentioned him? Yeah, yes. Because <laughs> me, early notes, they're about to... Early to mid notes, storm records. Mm -hmm. And then Storm showed up, and you guys had like everybody. Everybody. Then, everybody. Radio, Storm see. Records. That basically was just like, you know, once every other track was like Storm, 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 mm -hmm. Storm, Storm. At one point, sorry, I have to ask this question. Was Olisa working for you at some point? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was like, that was all, yes, it was yeah. as if that was all you used to play. Oh, uh, no, no, no. He wasn't working for us, but I'll, I'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's why I just said that you just confirmed. So there was that, then. Reality TV kicked off, and next to you, you know, Storm was basically involved in everything from Big Brother. There's even one called the Glow Niger Show. The Niger Sings. Yeah, Niger Sings. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just like, wow. To the point where you used to be a guy behind the scenes, and I think you were a judge on one of those shows. Uh, yeah, they found me, man. American Idol? <laughs> Nigerian Idol. Nigerian, Nigerian Idol. Really? American Idol. American Idol. Mm, yeah, American yeah, Idol. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Nigerian Idol. Mm. Nigerian Idol. Mm. Nigerian Idol. Mm. Nothing, you know? Dollars. You know that guy? Yeah, you used to be getting reality yeah. checks. <laughs> I'm you, I'm so, I mean, how did you do it? Was it always entertainment? Or was it music and then and then and then? No, I mean, I think, um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, Zoom, I owe you. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for having me. I mean, the thing about it is, I think for me, it all comes from the home, right? So, you know, I was I was brought up in a way that my parents were intellectuals and academics and really, really heavily into literature and music. And that affected me from day one. So I wasn't really, you know, it's like when you grow up at home, you don't realize that's not how everybody else is growing up. Mm -hmm. So in my house, I mean, I had to read like, I think when I was a kid, my dad came one day and said, you have to read like a book every week. 
something crazy. Like every holiday, you've got to read like 20 books. And somehow it became fun, which is even, I think about it now, I'm like, this is madness. But, you know, I still read like 30, 50 books a year. But then, you know, my mother, my late mother is from Awere, right? Okay. And my father's from Onitsha, I'm from Onitsha, but you know, the personality is a bit different. Okay, yeah. She met my dad, my dad be telling you how cool he was and how, <laughs> you know, he's the guy that gets all the ladies and how he could dance. The man couldn't dance, at least, not, <laughs> at least in my lifetime, I never saw the man show any evidence of dancing ability, mm-hmm. right? But my mother had all the skills, she could dance, she had the rhythm. Um, she went to college in the States, her first degree, and did a lot of first, but other things about it that she was playing drums in a girl group on campus, nice. you know, so the sort of creative side I think comes from her. And with that, the music, the love for the music I think comes from both of them because my father was heavily into jazz. My mother was heavily into that as well, but she was more into the Motown sound, yeah. mm-hmm. into soul. Mm-hmm. And then being from Awara, the Bongo High Life, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. so this is like Peacocks International, Oriental Brothers. And I'm hearing these sounds all the time, right? And then I remember as a kid, you know, my old man was in government, right? And as a kid, I remember, I think it's the only time it's ever happened that Fela Kuti played in government house in Enugu. Oh, October wow. 1. It has a rare occasion. Yeah, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, October 1, 1974. And I'm a kid, right? I mean, I'm like seven years old or something. But I just remember this because you can imagine the October 1 event is like yeah. Independence Day. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's all supposed to be black tie, very formal. And, you know, he's got the whole high and mighty of the East. He's got, you know, the chief judges, the bishops, mm-hmm. you know, all the sort of conservative leadership. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Out comes Fela. Wow. And <laughs> Fela's playing live in Government House. And Fela's <laughs> backing girls. Yeah, no, yeah no, with no, the, no, the girls as well. He was yeah. actually dressed, okay. but the girls were topless. <laughs> And, and, you know, I just remember, I'm seven years old. I think I was going like this. <laughs> and, you yes, know, your mom tried to come by your no, I mean, you know, My dad was just there smiling mischievously like, and I'm looking at my dad like, you really did this, right? And then, I'm, I'm a kid and I'm still thinking, wow, this is, I've never seen this before. You know? So, <laughs> and, you know, and the thing about it is, you know, things you don't, you don't ever forget. Yeah. And I went to England when I was about eight years old. I remember coming home one holiday. We used to come home every holiday. My parents were like, okay. Man, none of this, staying in England. Bam. Mm. It's like maybe I was 10, 11, and I'm coming back, and an uncle of mine, a late uncle of mine now, who is, who is a prof, he's in the house, and he's like, what music are you listening to? And I'm like, to be honest, I'd have abandoned my whole Nigerian side. I was mm. listening to Adam and the Ants, yeah. Dire Straits, Duran Duran, Shaking oh, wow. Stevens, like full Elvis Britpop. Presley. I was out. And I'm, I'm, I was in it. But oh, I thought John Travolta was competitive with Michael Jackson. Right? <laughs> I was that far sort you of You were gone. brainwashed, yeah. I wasn't brainwashed, but I was kind of like, I was leading. Yeah, and, lost you know, in and, the sauce. And, you know, he, yeah, he, he sat me down and he goes, he listened to me. He was just shaking his head and he goes. He's like, oh, boy. Yeah, I'm telling you, he's mm. like, my uncle's like, listen, you know, you need to go and listen to Fela Kuti. That the fundamental of everything is Fela. And I'm looking at my uncle like, really? You know, he goes, go and listen to a song called there. I listened to Gentleman like 30 times. And I decided that I felt I was God or something. You know? you. I was just like, literally like, okay. And from that, I remember about 1980, 81, I discovered hip hop and it's a rap. So it's like yeah. early days, man. No, once I found, no, no, I'm <laughs> literally, I am hip hop. I mean, we were the same age, basically. I mean, by the time I found Africa Bambada and Soul Sonic Force in mm-hmm. 81, 82, yeah. and Grandmaster yeah, Flash, Flash yeah. I saw Flash in concert in 83. Wow. I, saw, I, bought, I bought Run DMC's first album in New York in 83, Jekyll and Hyde. I mean, you know, I'm, first, I'm, t- I'm talking like... My first vinyl record that I owned, mm-hmm. as in that belonged to me, was mm-hmm. Grandmaster Flash and Furious Fire. You see what I'm saying? And it's kind of weird that my dad actually bought that for me. Yeah. And I was maybe five. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> now you're giving away my age, but, right? But isn't your dad very religious? No. But my mom is very little. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Imagine my dad buy me a record that is not ladder to heaven, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm like, okay. I said, no, no, that's me. I was, I was, I come from a family of radicals, so I was busy. By the time I'm 16, 17, I'm, I'm promoting clubs in London. Okay. I'm a DJ and I'm promoting clubs. And ah, no, because oh, the, so you, you were a DJ? Oh, I'm still a DJ, man. Oh. That's how I met Jimmy Jack. Okay. <laughs> I, right. I, I met him by Kate going to case him out. I wasn't, I was like, you know, they say you're a DJ. <laughs> 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 you can ask, you you ask, you ask Jimmy, man. He was like, yeah, yeah, no, no. So, so, for, so basically, yeah. So yeah, the music, I think my first passion is actually football. Okay. Yeah, for okay. real. And okay, I played it high let's level. Let's settle this now. Let's settle mm. this now. 
what club you support. And at Liverpool. Since 77. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, is this such a deflating response? Uh, no. no. <laughs> so I've hated Liverpool for many years, so it's fine. No, it's okay. We have, it's okay. We, 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 so like now we're having seats, I don't want to move my chair. Who, who would you support? Is that? Arsenal. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. Yes. Losers. The North London. Man United. Yes. United. Oh, United. Yes. Manuel. Yes. How does it feel yes. right now? Mm. Hold on. <laughs> Let's carry on. So like, so like when <laughs> Liverpool played Tottenham in the Champions League final, mm. I was like, is it possible that both teams can, can lose? lose. Yeah. You know, just because that would, but if one has to win, I had to say it with we will give it to the <laughs> Like literally. And then you met years. Jimmy Jatt and what happened next. Oh, you want to? Move so long. The segue. The segue. So I met, I met Jimmy. I met Jimmy. Literally, Jimmy, I met Jimmy around the time of my sort of introduction to Lagos, really. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't grow up in Lagos. I wasn't, you know, so when I first started hanging out in Lagos, really, for me, is the summer of 86. I'm like 17. I'm going to be 18 October that year. And I came here for my, I had a gap year after my A-levels. So my gap year, I'm going to go and work at the um, World Trade Center in Lagos, right? Mm -hmm. On Broad Street. And that was my job. But, you know, that wasn't my plan. My plan was, you know, I'm coming to Lagos, Lagos to, pa party. to rock, party, do all my things. <laughs> and being a, I came with like 300 records, uh, DJs. I'm, I came with an agenda. So I come to Lagos and um, I think, you know, just going around town and I'm hanging out with my, or Lisa's my cousin, and we're hanging out, we're going out all these different places, and I keep running into two particular DJs because I'm always checking the DJ. And I, you know, if you're a DJ, you check the yeah, DJ. Yeah. So, and in those days, there were really no clubs. There was Princes in Federal Palace, which was in the, like underground, and then there was um, Bagatelle and Bacchus, and Bagatelle and Bacchus were really Lebanese. Yeah. So, you know, we had to campaign to get black music played, and they might play you Michael Jackson around 1 a.m. for an hour. <laughs> And, that, and then, you, then you have to be happy, right? So yeah. this is like 85, 86. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, nah, that's not working for me. But Jimmy Jack and another guy called Bola Fresh Wave. And yeah, Bola Fresh Wave, Fresh is, yeah. of course. Now, Fresh Wave is still doing it. And he was like the king house yeah. party yes. DJ. All the old school jams. Jimmy was like the guy playing a little bit of hip hop and stuff. So I went to get a Jimmy Jack mixtape, which was the hottest thing you could do <laughs> in Lagos in, at that time. And it's shop of 17 Odo Street. So I get to Jimmy's place and I'm casing the joint. You know, I'm, I didn't come in there like a friend. <laughs> I'm coming there in my head. I'm like, come on, some DJ in Lagos. He can't have any skills. What's, what's, what, 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 what's he going to tell me, right? Not that I had the, <laughs> any skills. <laughs> just, skill, just, that, just like, I'm what? coming from Flash and those guys. I'm like, okay. But I get to his shop and Jimmy had a setup where if you walk into the shop, there's like a, thing going all the way around. And on this side, he has four sets of turntables, 12 tens, mix of 12 tens. Then that side, that side. So like maybe there's one, two, three, four, six sets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the first thing for me, I'm like, oh shit, he's got Technics. And you know, if you're a DJ, you know, Technics SL 1200 or SL 1210, this is the Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy's got like six pairs. I'm like, oh, ooh, okay. So I walk in and I'm like, okay. And the second test for me is like, I'm like, yeah, man, you know, I'm trying to get a mixtape. I never met him. I'm trying to get a mixtape. He didn't know who I was. He just listened to me, some English-speaking guy from London with a high top. My high top was very, you know, <laughs> pre, very kid, but very kid. No, for real, pre Big Daddy King. Kid hadn't even showed up yet. Kid hadn't even showed up yet. Kid showed up in like '87. Man. Kid in play. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, man. You know, I'm, I want this. I want that. And Jimmy's like, I give Jimmy a hard list because I was thinking, I'm in Lagos. Yeah, exactly. I'm in Lagos. It's gonna be. It's gonna have all this soft commercial music, you know, Leverts, and I'm like, Pfft. so I, I give my list. I give my list with the hardcore tracks. It's like, hey, you got, if you got Kumo D, if you got Rakim, if you got this, and frankly, he had like 80. percent So I was speechless. I was like, really? You've got all these records? So I had to check myself. I was like, ah, so this guy's for real. <laughs> so I went back out to the car because I actually had all the records myself, myself yeah? which I didn't have told him. I went back to the car and I brought out all my records. Wow. I said, no, no, no. Yeah, no, I was like, listen, man, obviously you're the real thing. Here are my records. Make a big statement that you like. And if you have anything here that you don't that you don't have, yeah. do it for yourself. You can have a copy. Because normally as a DJ, you have two copies of every yeah. record, especially the ones you're gonna use to break down. And that's like how I met Jimmy. And we've been we've been tight for 35 years. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. No, Jimmy, Jimmy is the truth. I mean, if people want to understand the foundation of the music industry, Jimmy Jad is like the core, at the core foundation, because you've got to understand the way this thing evolved. At that time, there were no producers, right? 
there's nobody doing anything. It's yeah. like the guys who are producing are doing like the reggae stuff, you know, the, the sort of mid 80s pop, yeah. you know, mandators, all these kind of guys. Uh, we're hearing them, right? My Jack was about to come, Ras Kimono was coming. But if you're 17, 18, that wasn't hot to us. Mm-hmm. We're listening to hip hop, we're trying to find something for us. Mm-hmm. And there was really nothing for us. I mean, I think that's, that's the first thing. So I went back to, I went back to England. Mm-hmm. It's university, right? Kept doing my thing, you know. So that's how I met Jimmy Jack. <laughs> Weird was that um, we're secondary school and had one of those, what you call like summer break, right? Mm-hmm. And then we're like, have to have a party. And everybody was screaming, okay, so who are the DJs out there? Yeah. We couldn't afford fresh waves. Mm-hmm. So we're like, okay, if you all put money together, we'll be able to get Jimmy. And then I think we put together like 80 grand. And one of us had to go and beg Jimmy that please just come and play at our party. And <laughs> that kind of thing where you had to like print out like these small cards, like IVs, and all the organizers, your names would be at the back. Yes, and then the most important thing was who's the DJ? So we put, like, this was like huge on the card, Jimmy Jack. <laughs> <laughs> the, the party day, this was. When you people are still naming parties. Oh, no, you have to name the party now. I'm trying to remember the name of the party, but it was just like Jimmy Jack was huge and our names were underneath it. So I was like, Yes. And when you're handing it out, people are like, wait, who's coming? Chat? Okay, we're well, there. They just say at my I friend's house. Be marketing for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, the, you see, the funniest thing about it is you just talked about something that a lot of people don't know. Yeah. But when we did, if I fast forward, yeah. 1991, yeah. and I come back to Lagos, done, I'm in law school, and again, I'm thinking about this whole situation. I'm like, man, I can't club to this Lebanese music all night. You know, there needs to be something else, right? Mm-hmm. There's nowhere for us, right? It was just house parties. Yeah. So I was waiting for one of my guys, Dato Lafora, who's like my brother who was in London and was with me, who understood what I was doing. I was like, bro, you need to move back to Lagos. Olisa was on TV doing uh, NTA2 Channel 5. Channel 5. Had this no, before sec- we even got to, yeah? I'll tell you about that. And so I'm like, I've been always feeding him you know, music videos and trying okay. to get him to play more hip hop on his show yeah. and whatever. But then at this time, there's a guy called Namdi Aneli who's much like an older brother. And that's the original Storm. And I formed oh, it. Okay. Yeah, I formed it. And there was, we did a club called Enter the Dragon. Now, if you were a certain age, you would know this club. Enter the Dragon was 1991 at Western House on Broad Street. And it's the first time anybody saw flyers in this town. <laughs> first time they saw DJs' names on flyers. First time, I mean, and my DJs, even if I go back and I think about it, and I tell you the DJs on that event and their role in Nigerian entertainment, it's incredible. And the story hasn't been told. It's Jimmy Jack. It's Howie T, who's Howie now Howie T, I know Howie T, yeah. And you know, Howie, beyond being a DJ, discovered P-Square, yes. right? It's GMG, who a lot of people don't even remember, GMG and Howie were partners. And GMG was married to... Peace, I am a Segway. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. <laughs> and GMG, wow. GMG oh. is a co-creator of the AMA, right? If you mm-hmm. think about that. Wow. So you just think about three DJs. Yeah. I'm a DJ, by the way. <laughs> so us DJ, <laughs> we we DJs, DJs, we DJs had a little you bit of up, impact. So why Storm? Storm? That's no, an interesting Oh, name. the name Storm? Yeah. Very simple, man. I'm a, I'm a comic head, always have been, okay. right? The storm, the name Storm came from Aurora. Yeah. Oh, okay. X-Men. X-Men. Yeah. Right? And the logo was very simple. It's like a black fist. Yeah. And then like and the like... elements, right? <laughs> so it's black power. Oh, nice. Yeah. So storm, storm was very sort of literal. Yeah. And it's the same philosophy that I've always had, which is that what we do matters. And what we what we will project is about that, right? So with that situation in 90, in 91, with Enter the Dragon, I remember, I remember this thing so well. It's a Chinese restaurant on the eighth floor. And they had the whole like the double floor, the whole floor yep. of Western House, right? And the guy who owns it was a big Chinese businessman. And he was like showing off to us. You know what, little kids, 21, 22, or at least I was. The other, some other guys were a bit older. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you know, he has so many containers coming in every month. Doesn't even have time <laughs> for the restaurant. You know, you make you so much money. The restaurant is just whatever, whatever. Are we even sure we can get 50 people to enter this space? <laughs> what? So, no, no, you know, I mean, fair enough. Well, true. True. Nobody nobody had done anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. And if you've ever promoted a night or done anything, you Hmm. know what first night feels like, The first night, madness, man. So we're sitting there, we've done all these flyers, and there's no social media, there's nowhere to print or give this stuff out. And we take this stuff and we we seeded it everywhere. We had people in New York, in London, in Ife, in Joss, 
don't know how the hell we did it, but we just had, you know, the dragon, the dragon, what's going on? Enter the dragon. Okay, no worries. Day of the event. We're sitting in this place. 8 p.m. We're alone. <laughs> 9 p.m. We're alone. Guys, by this stage, everybody's panicking. Like, bro, man, what if nobody shows up? 10.30, total mayhem. I mean, like, all the Western dogs. House only had two lifts, yeah. right? There's 2,000 people downstairs trying to come to Come up. up. <laughs> There's 1,000 people at the top floor trying to get in. And we're just there, like, trying to fight with everybody, <laughs> right? Just, like, people are just insulting everybody. Mayhem is going on. Mistake. And you know how much the gate fee was to get in? Big money, 59. <laughs> The big money in the back then was big. Money. No, no. You understand? It was big. It was big money. Let me tell. Let me tell you. People, bank MD, bank managers were getting thirty thousand naira a month in, yeah. the new, in the new banks, right? So they were feeling like, and they were. And I was like, you know, they were living the life. We split two hundred k the first night. So we were sitting there going like, hey, ain't nobody going to work in the bank. No way. We didn't know better, but we thought, okay, you know. But the thing about it, what I'll never forget is, the Chinese guy, two a.m. I spot him. Standing behind the bar, selling the drink, no story. <laughs> the bar was there. He was telling me, I said, I said ah, Mr. But Chad, are you okay? You be... He said, they're, they're going to steal my body. They're going to steal my body. <laughs> he wasn't even interested in letting anybody else sell the drinks. I, I would sell all the drinks myself. Uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> but we had like a four month run that summer, we rammed every night. We're once a, I think we're doing once a week, mm -hmm. Saturday nights, rammed every night. Um, it was a cultural moment for a lot of people. And I know a lot of people went back to their schools, universities, and did the same thing. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, a lot of DJs started doing the same thing. And what Mr. Chan thought he could do it without us. Ah, so he was mistake. like, ah, you know, it would be, I think this thing has run its course. <laughs> I think we will just do the thing. I said, no problem, Mr. Chan. Have a good one. Have a good one. We'll do our closing party next weekend. We did our closing party. <laughs> he announced something a few weeks later. Dead. He, he was there by himself. <laughs> Dead. You know, he didn't understand, and it was something that even till now people don't understand that having the venue is not the same thing as having the people, right? Yeah. yeah. And having a great relationship with those people. And I've got to admit, that's something that I think Storm had coming out of the gates mm. was that people pretty much knew your artist almost instantly. Mm. Once they dropped the song, it was like everywhere. And then everyone's talking about it. So you had like General Piles, you had the, um, what do they call it, NATO C. And, and these were like the people who were, because I remember. M.I. then was featuring on a NATO song. <laughs> you know that kind of stuff where well, it's you, weird. Well, you know, it's funny because people don't realize. I mean, I think it's like, you've got to look at it. If I look at it like this, right? Because that period is like a decade forward. Because yeah. I left, I mean, I stopped doing it. We did, I did Clapperboard Weekend Raps. Clapperboard is the first private TV private station. Private TV station, mm -hmm. yes, Nigeria. I remember that. And we went and created Clapperboard Weekend Raps and so was Sprite. Yes. And produced those two shows to put them on air. Yeah, Olisa was on Sprite. Yeah, he was a presenter, but he, yeah. he, he was the director producer of Clap of Weekend Audio, Raps. Yeah. But I think I created both shows, right? But the thing about it, well, at least co created them. But the thing about it is that um, on Clap of Weekend Raps, which was really interesting, because we used to have the rappers come through, right? And they come through, but before we let you go on air, mm -hmm. we've got to audition you. Yeah. So it's like a live audition in front of all of us before mm -hmm. we decide that you're worthy of the camera. And Jimmy was the DJ. Right, you see? And Jimmy's the DJ, and the opening and closing montage of the show yeah. is Jimmy cutting, cutting out. Yes, yes. And, and we make sure we put his address of his shop so the whole country knows, because we had it syndicated on 30 TV channels, the whole country knows 17 Odo right. Street, That's Jimmy how Because like, now that you remind me, that's, that's, why, how, we picked D, that's why we picked Jimmy to no, be no, the because, DJ at this stop. No, it was intentional. It was like the biggest thing. It was intentional. We knew that there's no way to promote DJs. If we put him in like that, at least kids, Clubs, schools. Yeah. His number's there. Yes. The address is there. His name is there. So Jimmy was there. And then there were no producers, right? Yes. So most of the rappers that come through don't know what they're rapping on. They're rapping on instrumentals. You understand? So Jimmy had all the instrumentals. You understand? Some human, <laughs> some human beatbox, <laughs> but instrumentals. And um, I mean, I'll tell you a couple of funny stories about that. Not well, not funny, but true stories. The first guy, one of the first guys that came through in the first time, and he came through hardcore with his crew from Ajegunle, and he was ready. Dad Shoki? Yeah, Dad yeah, yeah. Shoki. He used to be a rapper. Yeah, no, no, he was, he was a rapper. He came that day as a rapper. Fresh, busy crew, FBC. Fresh, yeah. busy crew. Yeah, from Ajegunle City. And Shoki was rapping and going off, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, who's this guy, man? The energy was just yeah. heavy, but it wasn't quite working. And I remember talking to him, and 
I was like, bro, man, I think maybe you're a dancehall artist. You know, maybe tweak this thing. And I didn't see him for two years. When I saw him two years later, now he's the daddy Shoki that you know yeah. now. And he had found himself, right? And he was ready to go. And we had a bunch of other guys who were like, you know, these kids that come out from London, whatever, and they were stuck in Lagos and, you know, whatever, or they were, whatever was happening with them. A bunch of these guys used to come through. Some of them were great rappers. The host of the show, which is really interesting, the host of the show is a guy called Freddie, okay? A Block was his rap name. Another brother living off crime. I always loved that name. <laughs> but it was a, it was a hard, hardcore name. But let me tell, let me tell, let me tell you something funny about him. Freddie today, he's worth like hundred million dollars. Doing what? Uh, he became a real estate guy in the UK. Okay. <laughs> Very successful. Not rapping. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That's what I am. Real estate. No, no, no. In London. Ah. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's done very well. But it's just, it's just weird about the connections. Connections, right? yeah. Um, but yeah, so but these guys came and all these people used to come through. And then one day these kids come through and they're rapping hard and they're going at the thing and I'm listening to the fake American accent and I'm like, guys, please, I bet, come, come, come. And then, oh, boss. I said, where are you from? So we came from AJ City. I said, okay. Why don't you rap about the journey from AJ to this place where we're shooting this thing in VI? I said, oh, what do you mean? I said, you're rapping about AK-47, <laughs> gangs. You've never seen an AK-47. You don't belong to a gang. So you're mm -hmm. projecting what you don't know. I mean, if you rap about the bus you took mm -hmm. from AJ to Sule to catch the one that brought you here, then you might have connection because the people around you understand yeah. what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. This guy's like, hmm. But they wanted to rap it American. You know, that's what everybody mm -hmm. thought it was. I'm like, nah, 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 nah. I said, listen, I think, even just to see whether you can rap in pigeon. pigeon. And it was just like a thing. And you know, I'll tell you something so weird. They went away, we, didn't, we forgot about them. You know, that's how life goes, we forgot about them. They came back the next time we were shooting. And they came back with a mission, man. These guys came, the guy had like four songs done. I mean, I mean, you know, he gets on stage and the minute he started, literally we forgot about everybody else. I mean, it, it, was, it was crazy. It was like, let's say I'm be sitting here and I know that this guy's great, this guy's great. So we know that the show's hot this mm -hmm. week. They're over here, we're like, we don't know what they're coming with. <laughs> so we just yes, keep them there just yes, as backup. So we shoot all these guys, then we shoot them. Mm -hmm. When they got on stage and started, Everybody here, all of us was going, hey, hey. I mean, I mean it, it, was, it was ridiculous. I'm clear too. Boy. No, I mean, I mean, you don't understand. And they had a dancer. There's this guy they had. I mean, till now, I don't think I've seen a better dancer. This guy was called Stickman or something. May so rest in peace. He passed. But I tell you, I mean, the way they came out, and <laughs> the funniest thing about it is, we had already recorded an album for a guy called Nadine true black man. And Nadine was a guy who I was lining up against my friend, actually, Blackie. Because mm -hmm. Blackie, right, was like the, the young guy yeah, that, yeah. that people knew, right? And they didn't know my link with Blackie. Blackie was a friend of my sisters, my younger sisters. And when I was, I think, when Blackie won the thing that got him the record label, mm -hmm. I drove him to Lecky Sunsplash. Because he was just like, my friend is like, Oh, bro, I'm going to go for this talent show. I'm like, okay, fine, let's go. Funny story about Blackie mm -hmm. and his hit song, Rosie. Mm -hmm. In the video, Rosie is like my wife's auntie. You see that? <laughs> you see that? So every, every family event, Edward, Edward, we bump into her like, ah, oh, Rosie, man, I hope hey, Rosie. This, <laughs> so, I hope Edward's hearing this, man. No, no. So listen, Blackie, Blackie's like family to me. So I'd taken him down there, so I'm like, I used to call him every day. I said, mm -hmm. I said, Edward, man, I've got this guy who's going to end your career. <laughs> Edward Blackie would be like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm telling you, this boy is vicious. And this kid was from, I mean, he's not a kid now, but at the time, he's a civil servant in, a, in Abuja because we never put out that album. Oh, well, man. Um, we shot a video, I think. We tried to shoot a video for the first single, which was called True Black Man. I can't even find the dat tape for the <laughs> album. I've been looking for the dat tape for 30 years. I mean, it's crazy, but he, he was incredible, right? And... Um, yeah, that whole Clap of We Can Raps basically led us to the Junior and Pretty album. Because what happened was... I had a feeling it was going to be Junior. No, no, I mean, they're the ones that are rapping, but yeah. you know what happened? You heard this thing, I'm like, okay, come here. Let's go, let's go. Because I recorded it in Clink Studios in 92 oh. with Kingsley Ogoro and Simi Apiola. Simi was the engineer. Yeah, Simi was the engineer for the Nodine sessions, wow. right? And 
you know, yeah, they, he hated me then because I was busy fighting over the samples. I was like, man, bro, you got this funny click sound from mm-hmm. the music because then we didn't have a lot of production. Yeah. So you get this metronome click in the mm-hmm. beat. And I'm like, nah, 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 nah. I need double bass on this thing. And I'm kidding. I'm bringing Jimmy in. Jimmy, come in, sample this thing, put it in. Can you do that? Yes. Double, <laughs> double the bass. Can you do that? Yes. I said, all these things are too tinny. So we were just like fighting over that stuff. I said, okay, you know what? I did that one there, finished it. Then I went to Agos Studios. Now, Papa, there's this crazy guy called Sam Ababot, who was professor. He was on TV. I was commentating about football. But he had a son, Sam Jr., mm-hmm. who was a musician. So I made the Junior Pre album with him. Yeah. And he is the producer. But I think I was in every session. And the thing, I mean, that's probably the last album I sat in every session because I really like to connect with the artists and sort of direct what they're going to do. Because I don't think, it's not as random. You can't just, oh, just go and sing. No, mm-hmm. no, 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 no. With all the artists, you have conversations to get to the point of the place where they're going to deliver something that might connect. Because you still have to find out what's the takeoff point? Who yeah. are you? Why should they care? All these things are all part of it, right? But a lot of times you don't necessarily know. So this is the question that's brought me as I listen to this story. This was during the Abacha years. This, this is, is before Abacha. Before Abacha. No, no, this is 92. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I guess it's not... This I mean, is the lead like, up to the Abacha So this is lead up. So this IDB. is basically IDB, like SAP has just ended. Mm-hmm. I was like, how are you, what is the headspace that Very makes young. you create mm-hmm. in the midst of all this? Like, mm-hmm. was there... Like, was there hope? Was it like that the world is going to be better? So like, how are you guys thinking about it? Because you're doing so many things. Even listening to you, I can feel the, the energy, energy, the hope, the aspiration. What so, I'm just seeing is film, film. No, film. yes, more of a series. I was thinking the Get Down yeah. in my head, that the Nigerian film. version of the Get Down. Oh, the Get yeah. Down is the Nigerian version of the Get Down. basically be awesome, yeah. but that's a whole yeah, other. No, 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 yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, it would be. But, but I'll tell you this, I think it's like this. First of all, I think it's that hip hop attitude, mm-hmm. like refuse to lose. We didn't mm-hmm. even understand I mean, I wasn't prepared to listen to anybody telling me it's not possible, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Because you're telling me this is impossible. I'm looking at you like, really? Mm-hmm. Okay, no problem. It's not possible. But when we come out the next day and there's 2,000 people out there doing the thing that I told you they were going to be doing, you're going to be like, oh, okay. So I've seen 30 years of people telling me it's not possible. Mm-hmm. Every time they told us it's not possible, we went and did it anyway. Mm-hmm. And it's, I think it's like, you know, if you, if, you, if you are prepared to be limited in your thinking, you can't really get anything done. Mm. And I think that what we were talking about, what I've always known and what I've always pushed is that there is an underlying global value that lies within the Nigerian. Yes. Mm. Sure. Yes. And that value is a value that globalizes. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people don't have the self-confidence to understand what it is. Mm-hmm. And until it manifests, they begin to see it. Mm-hmm. So it's like, so the journey from Junior and Pretty, mm-hmm. right? to Whiskid filling the O2 in 2018. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was there that night. And I can tell you, pretty much all black culture worldwide flew into that yeah. place that night for that show. Mm-hmm. And there are two things that made me really proud about that night. First things first is that my namesake, who's my younger cousin, is the one that tours Whiskid. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting with him in the box. And I know that all the promoters for all the festivals are there. Because that night is not just about Whiskid. Mm-hmm. It was about the movement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I build movements. I'm not really into... If I had been a different kind of person, then I don't think a lot of the artists out of Nigeria would have made it out of Nigeria because we had to create things and do things. I mean, me and Tola Odunsi must have moved over 200 artists' videos to Channel O. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not like they paid. Mm-hmm. We didn't charge anybody any money. We didn't take any money from anybody. But we made a plan. We said, okay, you know what? And we got the support of the building. So I'm like, okay, Joe Hunda... Martin Mabutu, my late brother who died, these guys were actually currying the stuff like drugs <laughs> twice a week for two and a half years. I mean, we're pushing this stuff. Waxy gets it and we get it to Waxy. Waxy, man, when are we on? And kids who had not even been seen in Festac, mm-hmm. who had not been seen in Sudan or in Joss yeah. or in Enugu, were showing up on Channel O to the yeah. continent. Hmm. That made Nigerian TV embrace them. Yes. It didn't happen the other way around because yes. our people are always looking outside. Yes. We gaze outside. We don't see ourselves, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So because they're looking outside, say, so, oh, wait, so who's this Two-Face that they're saying back to us? Eh, he's here with us. Okay, uh, please bring him on the show. Yeah. You know, Two-Face has been trying to get on your show for two years, but you were t- treating him like, hey, who, are you? who is he, who is he? I think you guys probably started 
So I'll give you one. And I totally agree with you because for a long time, Nigerians always seem to look outwards. And I remember back in the day when you go clubbing and you never hear Nigerian music. Of course. So you either hear Nigerian music at the beginning of the night or at the end of the night to let you know that it's time to go home. Mm -hmm. Right? So in between. <laughs> in between. Remember when I was cold, huh? <laughs> in between, they give you everything else that you want to listen to. But, and I also, and I think Channel O helped in the sense that when Nigerian, we started seeing ourselves mm -hmm. on the international stage, it made us accept our songs a lot more. And then there was now that gradual shift from us being played at the beginning and at the end of the night to now being played smack in the middle of it, where at one point, a friend of mine told me where I would go, I want to go somewhere where I don't have to listen to Macaulay Marale. <laughs> Which is <laughs> that, you know, I just want to go somewhere where I can just hear something completely different because it was like everywhere you go. It w and for us, it was like gradual, like, like a frog in hot water, right? In boiling water, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't notice, but gradually we went from listening to foreign music, listening to foreign music, dancing to foreign music, then all of a sudden we stopped hearing foreign, foreign music and it was just Nigerian music everywhere. And I'm like, okay, now I have to actually seek out places yeah. where you'd find foreign music. And this happened, what, 15 years? Yeah, no, it, it was, it was, no, the tipping point was, I guess, from 04, so jump from 04 to 2011. Yes. Yeah. So that's what, how many years is that? Eight years, seven yeah, years? It's, that yeah, was, that period so was, was... Like, 04 was the struggle, struggle, struggle. Yeah. 2010 was probably 50-50. By 20... No, 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 no. 2010 by, was probably like... 20, by 2010, I think we had crossed. was like... Tw no. I think we by 2010, we had crossed, though. We, we had... had a, so 2050 20, started like maybe 20... 11, no, 12. Well, I mean, when did the video come out with, um, what do you call it? Yeah. Yeah. I think Damage Road was roughly about when I just stopped hearing foreign music in the clubs and it was just Nigerian music. And I was just like, I mean, so Damage Road must have been like 2012, 2013. No, but there's something that you said that was very interesting about, and this is, and I always wonder that maybe this is one of the things that is the difference between music and movies. Mm -hmm. Nollywood is a purely local phenomenon. Yeah. Like it, so that sense of superiority that sits on local stuff mm -hmm. is fully there with Nollywood. Like when we first, when I first started making, they're like, they would blink as if they could see me before when I was in private equity. When I make film, you, you, you make film? Okay. Why? Like, so that whole skepticism <laughs> thing, because Nollywood was literally, we did it for us by us. There was no, we don't want nothing. I mean, yes, African Magic, but African Magic was 2010-ish. But is that thing of, okay, the internationalization thing, because Nigerian music has always traveled, right? From the fella days, there has always been the globalization aspect of it. Do you think that mm. turned the... Not, mm. not let, let, let me, let me, I think, mm. I think, I think, you see, I think it's like this, right? I think, I mean, even though the Nollywood guys don't always admit it, I've been there with them since day one, too. Okay. So, I mean, I funded some Nollywood stuff back in 95, 96. Oh, is that good? Oh, yeah. Not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, we all have our experiences. <laughs> you know, and it's funny things. All this stuff you say, well, you're funding this thing like you were one rich man. There was, there was no money. <laughs> we were like, just stretch one of our cobwebs in the pocket and contribute to the process. But the thing about it is this, right? I think um, even till now, Nobody has ever really supported the Nigerian music industry. We just made it happen. Yeah. By itself, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nollywood has always got the support. Okay. Nollywood has. I'm telling you. Well, from a government, well, you stand, let, let, yeah. from a government yeah. standpoint, yeah. I would yes. be that. I mean, yes. we got a grant and no, we had just started. So yes. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, me, let me give you an example, right? So what I'm talking about is this, and the Nigerian music hadn't globalized. That's the cultural music okay. on the traditional music on 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 the sort of global world music sort of circuit. Mm -hmm. Imagine like this. My first agenda almost was to destroy anybody placing our music in world music. Because mm. once you put me in world music, music yeah. I'm out of the game. I can't even get in the radio. I can't get in the clubs. I can't be in the playlist. I'm not bringing NATO C and these boys. I'm not bringing the hot boys to be sitting with Lady Smith, Black Man Basel. It cannot be the case. Yeah. You know, so it's very, I mean, I love Lady Smith, Black you know, Man Basel. Well, it's a different but I don't understand. No, no, we're, yeah. we're, 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 building, we're trying to build sex symbols. We're trying to yeah. build people who girls are going to throw their panties on the stage for, mm -hmm. stuff like that. The band, all these yeah. guys. It's not about the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I tell them all the time, I said, if you want to understand the reality, if you look at Bernard Boy's 2019 streams, and I'm not even going to take David and Wiz and add to the mix, yeah. and I'm a lover of Fela and everybody else, but just doing 600 million streams in 2019, 
Burner Boy has done more streams than all yep. Nigerian legacy artists combined. Yep. All. Ooh. Lifetime. Lifetime. All. Ibnizo Bay, Fela Whoa. Kuti, Rex Lawson, bring them all, bring the top 100, combine them all and put it next to just one guy one year. So then you understand that what we have done is, and what we're still doing, it's still, look, we're just starting. Yeah, of course. We're like 2% of the world market. And we're just breaking in through the door. If you, if you break it down properly, I would say another five years. Mm -hmm. Only? Yeah, another five years. What I'm trying to, so what I mean by that is, it's about building properties, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, right now, I would say Whiskit is Whiskit and, and Burner and David mm -hmm. are arena artists. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. In certain markets, specifically the UK. I was telling them this fill... like last year. No, he was arguing between him, them and okay. Yemi Alade about whether no, Yemi, Yemi because is, of her Africa. Yeah, she's great, but yeah. she can't sell the tickets in London yet. And it's also to do with your representation. It's wow. not just wow. that. Wow, like, bring your head down. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, we argued this thing for like no, three no, hours. No, but, uh, yeah, no, no, but she sell out in France, mm. for example, mm -hmm. in Belgium. But you know, the, the key market for music in Europe is the UK. UK. But that's the argument. But like, so we said France and Africa matter too. That was the hot fight. <laughs> oh, I see. No, but the French, you give them the francophone oh, thing. Yeah. You know, so they have their thing going. But it's not the same thing. I mean, it's like by boys out of, you know, no disrespect to the Francophone boys and the boys from Cameroon and Senegal, they do their thing. Let's not forget, Makosa yeah, well, and big, Dombele, <laughs> they're still big. I mean, you know, this is what we build on. It's like hip life. Yeah. Hip life was a big inspiration to me in terms of what happened here because I'm like, I got to Ghana like 96 and I'm like, Jesus Christ, these guys. I met Reggie Rockstone. Reggie Rockstone. Yeah, <laughs> my boy Panchi Anoff, who, who created Hip Life with Reggie. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. I mean, I'd never heard it before. I'm in the club, in a hip hop club. I'm a hip hop head and I'm, and I'm freaking out. And 2 a.m., the music changes and this thing comes on and the whole place exploded. And I was like, what the hell is going on? What is this music? And that was Hip Life. Yeah. And those guys, Tiny, Reggie Rockstone, those guys really pushed the envelope. And it made me feel like, you know what? We Nigerians need to have our self-confidence because yeah. music is about self-confidence. All this stuff True. was about, do you have the belief in what you're doing? Mm -hmm. It's kind of what you're saying about the DJ mix and yeah. the clubs. Mm -hmm. The DJ mix and the clubs, you're all right. It's, we started cracking it heavy from 05. Mm -hmm. by, by 2010, it was feeling balanced. By 2015, you couldn't find American music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like if you hear an American record or a British record, a non-Nigerian record, you start feeling like, ah, oh, what happened? You know, and I, but I think we overdosed. You've got to sort of balance it. No, I know. We're, we're I full love on, we, No, we full on owed it. I'll now give you I love one. it. We had like an event. So. Oh, no, because so Zulu has been trying to say that we should throw out Hollywood films of Nigeria. No, Zulu, so, Zulu, yeah. Zulu. Zulu is ready for the OG. I'm, as it. I'm ready for Nigeria. Zulu, if Zulu was... Possibly like if, a if Chinese had the or, or board, If she didn't have the sensors board. She'll be like China, where <laughs> literally nothing. <laughs> 20 nothing. Films but a see, year. see okay. where China is after just how many years of being <laughs> no, no, but, Okay, but there's something you said, and, I, and our, <laughs> our producer is flashing. Uh, yeah, yeah, Leave I'm, it. Yeah, okay, I can't see. Can you see I've been listening? What's I'm wrong? Just, I'm just seeing the flashing. We're literally just being tailed by Moonlight. We're sitting at his feet. That's what I said, you see. I'm a prophet. It's not about me again. No, but so there's this thing you said, and it's sort of about the difference between com the opportunities that mm -hmm. being in the commercial conversation brings versus being in the, I guess, other conversation. Because world music is important, but it is not the commercial conversation. No, no, it was commercial in the sense that, look, Fela, King Sonia Day, Obinez Obey, even Labaja, even Femi Kutito now, Shen, they're in that circuit. Okay. They're getting certain amount of shows per year minimum. They'll get their 30K per show, 50K per show. Uh -huh. But it's not the same as having 16-year-old girls uh -huh. in cities all over the world singing your songs. Okay. That's pop culture. Yeah. Yeah. So what has happened is we've placed ourselves bang in global pop culture. Uh -huh. And that is what my agenda always was. That we're not... We're you're not, not, like, you're not niche. You're it's not like Bollywood. Genre, it's yeah. like Bollywood, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bollywood has great actors that are known, great female stars. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Nobody wants to be them. Mm -hmm. Except the Indians, mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people want to be these Nigerian stars. Yes, that's a different connection that we have. So that's I'm, how we globalize. So that's a valid, and Nollywood is actually a very good example because it's a. But it's the same thing for Nollywood. Yeah. Yeah. You think? Nollywood? Of course. If Nollywood, listen. Let me tell you something. So, I'm okay, okay, let, let, let me, this, so this is the part I want. This is part I, I want this to hear. This will actually be our first part one part two. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is this is part I want to hear. So like Nollywood, you said like the like Bollywood. So 
Bollywood how was his career effectively. So how, would you, the place, how would you award. place how would you place Nollywood? I think look, for me, Donnywood is an incredible story that remains untold. Right? I think perhaps the greatest story that has not been told is the story of Nollywood. And I keep telling them. I'm like, you know, you people sit here, we can debate back and forth every day. Where's the story of Nollywood? How Nollywood happened is a debate, right? Mm -hmm. Kill the debate, just make the bloody film, make the series so that people can understand how this thing came. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the only things you see is this little BBC docu from back in the day. Mm -hmm. Forget all that. Nollywood was bootstrapped. When yeah. people talk startup, that's the original yeah. startup industry, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So Nollywood is a startup industry. So is the music industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the music industry has been the primary inspiration for the startup boys anyway. Yeah. So all the tech boys doing startups, they're all coming out of the music industry vibe, right? And Nollywood should have been able to claim that as well because Nollywood, to be honest, came first in the sense that by the time Nollywood was breaking, the music industry wasn't in the same place. The yeah. major labels left here in 93 yeah. and yeah. left everybody hanging. Yeah. Sony, Polygram, they just bounced, right? Mm -hmm. So the music guys were now hanging. But people like Shino Peters and Adewola Yuba were selling 2 million records in 92. Yeah. It's not like they weren't selling. Do you understand? They were getting their checks, right? But when this thing happened, Bangira's thing happened, and all the labels left, and there's nobody to say, oh, this is how we're going to go forward, right? Mm -hmm. But Nollywood, right? Nollywood is like revolution. And the second part of the problem with Nollywood is the fact that free-to-air television in Nigeria mm -hmm. does not provide commissioning. Yes. Yes. Because you have to understand that Nollywood is primarily a TV game. It's not cinema. All this thing that gazing at cinema all the time is television. Yes. Yeah. Nollywood is built on television. That's why Nollywood is perfect for the streamers. Yeah, and yeah. Nollywood is perfect for the streamers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just focus on that. And the truth of the matter is, look, for me in Nigeria, if you go back to the 70s, Nigeria had 13,000 screens, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Pre-Dolby. Mm -hmm. It is the Dolby investments that killed the screens in Nigeria because all the screens were mom and pop stores. Yeah. Yeah. Guys couldn't afford that the works. upgrade. Yeah, upgrade. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now you have, what, 180, 200 screens, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you, she mentioned China. We don't have China's money. Mm -hmm. China built 9,000 cinemas a year for 10 years, yep. right? That's 90,000 cinemas, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That creates an ecosystem yeah. mm -hmm. that is of enormous power because beyond that, they're creating content as well. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. creating merchandise. They're pushing it all through. In Nigeria, you still have a disconnected marketplace. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the content at the level you want it. You certainly don't have the merchandise. Mm -hmm. You don't have the goods from the product you're creating. Yeah. So we're not monetizing through the value chain, right? Yeah. Meanwhile, if you break it down fully, I would say Nigerian actors, comedians, sportsmen, athletes, influencers, and musicians have easily a billion followers. Yes. Yes. In 2021. Yes. Where's the goods and the merch for them to monetize their following? There's a big gap, right? So that's why I say that it's still just starting. Mm -hmm. And as we evolve and progress, Nollywood itself, I believe, I mean, it's weird. You know, I'm looking at the numbers and the feedback for Amina. Right? Yeah. yeah. Top 10 in 42 countries. Yeah. Yep. I had an option in it in 2017, mm -hmm. and I really didn't like it. I mean, I've been pushing for the epic movies nonstop. That's my thing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, listen, why are we making superficial things when we've got the richest stories on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. You think the Greek gods are anything? Let, was, what's was the difference? Of storytelling? No, yeah. no, I mean, Shango and Thor. This is, yeah. the, I said, listen, the X Men had what, $60 billion at box office? Mm -hmm. Where the Orisha? The Orisha are the X-Men 10 times boom. Where Shango? Thor is $20 billion. Shango is broken Lagos. Whose fault is that? It's our fault because it tends to be our own lack of ability to engage ourselves. Or, belief, or lack of belief in the story? No, no. no it's no, not no, lack of belief in the story. It's, it's in it's pulling it off properly. It's the, I don't even think it's that. No, but it's not because Amina is basically an example of it was done on a Nigerian budget. It wasn't done on an international budget. Yeah, but nobody budget. likes it in Nigeria. No, it's mixed. No, it's I think mixed. It, That's no, a harsh version. I think, I, think, I, think, I think it's like this. I think, yeah. I think that with Amina, the he could have made... The story of Amina would sell. That's it's what I'm saying. That's what is happening. That's why it's for yes. two countries. But the execution of the film... But it, well, I think the execution has its challenges. Yeah. yeah. Um, as, I, said, as, I, I, certainly, I certainly felt that they could have told the story better. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that they made an effort with the period costumes and the sort of bat, big battle scenes. And that's scenes, the thing, they can do the better if they were better funded. I'm not even sure. I don't think that it's Let a... me tell you something, though. I think, I think a lot of times in Nigeria, everybody especially funding, funding, funding. They talk about money, money, no, money. Matters, when it comes to so. epic, no, no, wait, wait, yeah, when it comes to yeah, epic, when it comes to everything. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. But epic especially. I hear you, I hear you, but <laughs> I come from somebody that produced well over 200 music videos and mm. content pieces and reality shows. We know how to cheat. <laughs> so, yeah, yes, yes, you could... I mean, look, 
the movies are made with a half a million dollars mm -hmm. in other countries that look like they're made with $500 million. It's all about what you're, you know, I think that there are excuses for certain things. For me, I would say, no, 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 I was about to say, but let me not add you too no. much. But, and again, the infrastructure in those countries is good. No, you don't have to, we have no, listen, you don't have to tell me. Time. When you see our music videos, you think that is how it looks. Well, we go on sets <laughs> to make a music video. I always laugh. I said, no, if somebody comes to the set of the music video, they see the final product. Like, how does that happen? Yeah, I said, bro, so, because we're creating fantasies. No, so even, even in Nollywood, speaking for ourselves, we do the same thing. But, but one of the difficulties of film mm -hmm. is time is a problem, right? Of course. So you see, and time is money. So leave aside all of, of course. that. But the chat, so there's a, so the way in my head, so it, on, I did the math one day. Don't get me twisted, though. I know budget is an issue. No, it's not even, that what I mean. Mm -hmm. like, so a Nigerian movie that costs, um, let's say, I spent 60000 in a Nigerian movie. The equivalent production value that you get for spending 50000 in a Nigerian movie is probably the equivalent of three or four times that, even as we are. Of course. But the problem is that like 50000 is generally, there's a base level of suspension of disbelief that you can do per budget level. Yeah, of course. So if I give you $500,000 million to, $500, to a Nigerian, mm -hmm. they will make it look like $5 million. Yeah. But then the problem is that when you get a Nigerian $500 million, they're trying to make a film that should be worth $20 million. So that's where the gap is. Gap is which so, you so you see, those are the things that you see where like our ambition is it's like, is against driving. The of course, like your pockets so, and your ambition. So, so like we are constantly jumping over. I mean, so, and it's so funny, like we, 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 we call it like all of our films, we are always more ambitious. So like the one that Damala still drags us forever is new money. So we made new money for maybe a hundred K max, something like that, right? <laughs> This is a movie about a billionaire family, mm -hmm. right? Who <laughs> and we sit the in their world fully. You don't sit there like, oh, we go there for one day and we come out. We are fully in the billionaire world. And you're just you're trying to. We're just, we're just in tight spaces. And I'm just like, please. <laughs> no, where's the so, money? So my point is like, but you see, that suspension of disbelief, the audience will follow you. Mm -hmm. to, but the people, so, so like, the one I was like, no, no, nah, please. Let's, if I go to make a film about rich people, let's never do this again. Because <laughs> you cannot, because you, there's a certain level. There's a level to which you can't fake the fun. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, but you see, we, I was like, no, people like that film. They are good with us that if you ask them jam question, of course they're not billionaires, but they are rich enough for our films, okay? So, so, so that's basically that trade-off. But you see, if that film is traveling and you're saying those people are billionaires, in their head, they're thinking crazy uh, rich Asians, right? Yeah. Where is the jet? Where is the yacht? Where is the all those? Just things? give me the stretch limo. <laughs> just at least. You know, well, ne next time, next time, talk to some of us. We can get you some of those things. You see, <laughs> no, but no, but you're going to be getting a lot of calls. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you see, the thing is, I, I mean, look, my my belief is that I think Nollywood, right? And you know, it's funny. I think there's so much more to come. Oh yeah, yes. Um, I, I don't really think the surface has even been scratched. I kind of feel like there's so many genres that are untouched, right? Yeah. Yeah, I always talk about the epic stuff. I always talk about historical biopics mm -hmm. because nobody has told any stories about anything in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. You know, and, I, and, I'm, and whether it's political, whether it's sporting, whether it's cultural, mm -hmm. whether it's music figures. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if I name 10 names here, Fela Kuti, Zeke, Awo, Sadona, Ibn Ezobe, King Sonny Ade, nothing on any of them. Yeah. And that's just five people. Right. So well, the if story... You, if you had to flip it, for example, and call it James Brown, there are like about five movies about James Brown. That's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. Nelson Mandela, they're over 70. They're over yeah. 70. Every black American every... has played <laughs> yeah. Mandela. That's, that's, those are the movies. Yes. If you go to the documentaries... Is, uh, yeah. man, I mean, Obama so, alone has probably... At this point, he has five movies about my man yeah. has just left. <laughs> but I mean, and, and the crazy thing about it is, if you know Zeke's story, none of them is close to Zeke's story. Oh, yeah. Maybe only Mandela. And the thing is, we don't project our people and we therefore don't tell the story. And it hurts us yeah, because yeah. what ends up happening is it's a theory of reductionism. Mm -hmm. So Nigerians are always reducing themselves. Yeah. Those eh, what do you do? No, don't, don't play with this, these people. We don't have a celebrity culture. Is it about celebrity? No, no, is it, is, this, is not, this is not about celebrity. No, 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 in a healthy way, you know, the way the Americans do it. You think so? I mean, yeah. BBN would disabuse you. Even but, but, our no, 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 but I think, no, no, but let no, me but tell you the truth. BBN. Those are still superficial things. I think what it is is this, right? Mm -hmm. let, let, you, know, you know, the problem is this. This is what I see anyway. That in Nigeria, and it's, it's part of a bifunction of social media, mm -hmm. Nigerians are very emotional people mm -hmm. and very reactive. And, as, and by nature, 
for the last five years, what I see Nigerians do is sharing negativity 70 to 80% of the that's time. That's the thing. We always want to True. bring people down. Whatever yeah, well, money you have, you're fraudulent. Yeah, you know, that's what I'm you're, saying. So you're a whore. When you're, when you're, thank you. So because you're sharing negativity, mm -hmm. it's like self-perpetuating mm -hmm. yeah. negativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like people that tell you, oh, Nigeria never did anything. Mm -hmm. uh, we're useless. And I, tell, I said to somebody, you know, this thing, Big Brother, that you said, mm -hmm. before the first Big Brother Nigeria, which I produced in 2006, if you Google Big Brother Nigeria, what you will see is 10,000 pages of African countries thanking Nigeria, their Big Brother. Yeah. That's the fact. We used to watch them. Not just watch them, we still do. No, we still do. No. And we, in the Africa, people yeah, African. No, 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 no. Hold the on. African countries, heads countries. of state, oh, right. because of the 54 African countries, right. Nigeria is directly responsible for the independence of 46. Right, right, right. right. Okay. So, and when I say responsible, I don't so just mean... So, you're referring to us as Big Brother. Yes. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. right, right. Because right. it's not just that... I got it. it. Look, it's like South Africa, yeah. right? My South African friends and brothers... <laughs> look, listen, man. Somebody said to me the other day, oh, how do I look at it in the continent? Can you know South Africa lead the continent? I said it's not possible. How? I said no disrespect to South Africa. I love them, but we lead the continent. Why do we lead the continent? We earn the right, right? Why do we earn the right? When South Africa declared apartheid, right? There are we things that Nigeria we did. We took Nelson Mandela in for a period of time. It's not just Mandela. <laughs> I'm just saying a bunch. I mean, of the things that they're, they're yeah, multi-layered. Multi like yeah. multi-layered. Every multi so keeping. If you yeah. go and look at it. Anti-apartheid commission in the United Nations. It is chaired by Nigeria yeah, from true. beginning yeah. to end. True. If you read the statements made, the Frontline Commission, the South African Defense Force, Nigerians, all Nigerians paid income tax to South Africa for 35 years. Over half a million South Africans went to school in Nigeria free, through secondary school and, and university. And Becky was here free in university. So it's not, of course. No, no, no. So don't so don't talk to me. We're not the same. You okay. understand? Tell him. No, no, I, oh, no, I do. Tell him, Obi. The last time I was in, and I've been in SA for years, last time I was supposed to be in SA this week, actually. I was supposed to be in Durban. Where you were supposed to be here. Yeah, yeah. 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 Afrexit can't can wait. you have to be here. Afrexit can't wait. I'll be Afrexit can't wait. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They didn't have my check record. Yes. That's <laughs> it. That's it. That's it. So Zulu made the call. I said, no, you know, forget, yeah. forget those clowns. Oh, no. Run my check. Forget those clowns, <laughs> man. <laughs> forget those clowns. No, but, but like you said, I think it's like, but all, it's also the responsibility of the storytellers. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. True to tell the stories of the greats, because we've produced so many greats. But, you know, if you, if you sit there and all we talk about is a negative, then that's all there is to talk yes. about, right? Sure. So it's, I think it's always about those people who can see the light and point you to the light. If we want to live in darkness, we can do that too. And some people seem to think that's the best way to live their lives. I just think that's not the energy that anybody should really be projecting. We know the difficulties, we know the negativities, but I tell you what, the spirit, the character, the talent, the intellig intelligence yeah. of the Nigerian has always been world class. Yeah. The fact about it is, do you recognize it? And if you recognize it, do you, do you it? engage it? And if you engage it, why not celebrate it, right? So whether it's Fela Kuti or you know, any one of our millions of young talents, right? It's it's a long history, man. We got it's just that when you well, like, if I really think about it. I'm like, there's a thousand, if not a billion untold stories sitting in Nigeria. Yeah. The world has run out of stories. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't understand it, that's what it is. Asia's done. They've done Asian stories. They've done the Chinese stories. They've done the Japanese. Mm -hmm. They've done Europe. I mean, Europe has mined itself and is now going back to do remakes, right? Mm -hmm. Africa. Yeah. The land of original mythology. That's the land of original mm -hmm. mythology. We don't need to be telling any other stories. Mm -hmm. If you just enter the cosmology of the Yoruba, the cosmology of the Igbo, you have at least within them alone, you have entire franchises. Yeah. But you know, what I was saying, the reason why I was saying we haven't engaged these things is that's the balance, that's the battle with colonialism. Because when the colonials come and tell you that everything about you is you, negative, negative, you, and you believe it, what they have. you believe it, so you haven't taken your title because you're now a Christian, right? Mm. You're, you're conflicted. And that a conflict is the internal conflict that has damaged Africans. So Africans do not actually push out their essence. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And our essence is our value. And that's the fundamental truth about it. And mm -hmm. when we engage our value, we always win. Because you can't touch it. The, our essence is actually, it's like, if you look at black Americans and you look at us, you know we're all the same, right? Same, yeah. yeah. Same. But we're first cousins. The first cousins. What's, <laughs> what's the, first the difference? Cousins. Because they're they West African. Lost. Most of them are West African. They seem lost. Hmm? Most lost. of them are West African. Oh, no, I said they seem. How do they seem lost? It, 
they're not where they're supposed to be. No, no, so is that so that, well, no. So I would totally disagree with that. So I would say that like that double-mindedness is not them, it's their society. So it's not them because they have- Who's Them or us? No, no, I mean, so, so black Americans have, there's that thing they say double-mindedness where you are in your home, but there, there's they institutions and welcome stuff that your... don't welcome you. Yeah. So, yes, but that's not them being lost. They have fought no. for their place now. So they don't, it's not They're not lost. No, 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 yeah. I'm not, mm -mm. I don't mean it in that sense. I okay. mean in the, the whole essence thing. It's mm. like, they're there for a reason. They're there, that's their home, ETC, but they are black. Of course, they know that. Yeah. No, yeah, but you, see, I, no, <laughs> yes, not, but you see, but you see, that's, I, I, I understand what thought. you are saying, but I think that over, the, this thing about my history. So if I have mm -hmm. a th like 300 years of history in a place mm -hmm. and I'm telling those stories and I'm celebrating those stories, mm -hmm. that the way you find yourself is to, is where do you come from? Mm -hmm. And they have tons of stories about where they came from. The difference was like, those stories were not getting told. It's the same thing. It's only like, remember, like we grew up watching like black stories, but it used to ebb and flow, ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. But now they now feel that they can tell their stories. Remember, there's a time when, just, this is just 15 years ago, the only black movie being made by Hollywood was Tyler Perry, mm -hmm. right? They stopped all the, like, all, pretty else. much everything stopped, right? Mm -hmm. But now you're seeing different stories emerge. When you're able to tell your story, look at when they see us, the Eva DuVernay thing about yeah. the, mm -hmm. the, that boys. story, was, would never have gotten made. It continued, like, like just mm -hmm. go 10 years ago. You get what I mean? So being able to tell your stories, I mean, underground railroad, mm -hmm. I mean, this like, I mean, so I, I mean, I, I like- now their stories. Yes, I like Django Unchained, but I yeah, mean, no. as Will Smith said, nah. he's not doing that for Quentin Tarantino, right? Because mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing, right? Yeah, so, I mean, I mean let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me even, let me add to it, like, let me put it to it like this. And the reason why I mentioned is like this. The number one collaborator and the number one partner and the number one people that have uplifted black people on the planet are black Americans. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Every benefit that black Africans have comes from the work they did. So for me, I think anybody in Nollywood who is not engaging them as a first point of partnership is missing the point. Because you've got to understand like this, we live in a white world. It's not, it's not theoretical, you live in a white world, right? It's, it is what it is. Some people don't understand racism because they haven't lived in the West. I lived in the West 25 years. There's a construct to yeah. this world. It's a white world. Black guys don't get the same access, they don't get the same funding. And yeah. when they do, it's because of extraordinary things have happened, right? Mm -hmm. The biggest funding anybody's ever gotten for anything to do with African music is Beyonce for Black is King. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, she used five Nigerian co-directors, a co-creative director who really directed things, a Ghanaian chap. She embedded all the fashion designers, all the musicians, and push the money through them. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that is something that no African could have done because you mm -hmm. couldn't have gotten the budget, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then I see Africans bitching, oh, Beyonce's cock right. I thought, are you kidding me? You spent 10 years getting her to the position where she would lead <laughs> and do You this could do thing. that, yeah. Don't ever be hating on yourself, just hating on yourself. That's one side. The other side is when you look at like my brother, James Samuel, right? Yeah. He's Seal's brother. Mm -hmm. Also related to my wife, by the way. Oh, nice one. James, well, so I'm just say, saying, I'm, I'm just saying, saying. Problem. I'm just saying. That's no, but, first Rosie, now Seals brother, I mean, who's next? No, no, but James, you see, the thing is this, this is crazy what I'm talking about. James is a London boy, yes. right? James is a musician, really. At heart. Been doing his music, music for 20 years. He's been Jay-Z's best, one of his best friends for like 15 years. And James is just who he is. And the movie James made is specifically about what you're talking about. It's about the fact that people didn't see us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we didn't even realize we weren't being seen. If you're a black kid sitting in Africa in the 70s and 80s and watching cowboy films, you're not even asking why there are no, why black, there are no people. black people. Why there no black people, yes. Because it hasn't occurred to you that yes. this is actually an issue. Yeah. And if you're growing up in America, you're, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, really, we're not in the film, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's like, are you kidding me? Of course we're in all these things. We're in all these stories. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have the opportunity. We didn't have the budget. Like you're saying, it's like Nollywood, right? Mm -hmm. So the Nollywood journey is the same journey as a black filmmakers in America. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And what you see is this, is that, yes, in terms of the essence being lost, dislocation does that, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody asked to be sent to America. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked to be a slave. Mm -hmm. But what I see is this, is that, you see, sometimes in Africa, and a lot of times I think black Africans, we don't understand the power we wield sure. by combining. Mm -hmm. Black American women, right, every year, their spend, their consumer spend, mm -hmm. not investment, mm -hmm. is more than the total revenue generated by the African continent. As 40 million black American women make more, spend more money on <laughs> lifestyle entire, entire than continent. the entire continent generates as economic base. 
What that tells you is that your primary economic partnership should be with the black Americans. You, but we're busy chasing white boys who are not really primarily interested in doing, partnering with you the same way. And that's the same problem I see in Nollywood. I see it in the music side. I see it in the comedian. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because if you've got the right partners right now in the States, if you're a black woman in 2021, you're hot news. Because everything now is Black Lives Matter. And I tell people, if I had a female partner, I'm putting her in front. I, I, in fact, I wish I could be female, change my sex. <laughs> no, because... I you a week. Tyler Perry get upset, man. Tyler, Tyler Perry be like, what's he doing? I like that. Why are you trying to jump my style? Medea's Mad- Mad- new, new groove, man. <laughs> no, no but, it, but it works. I mean, see, because the thing is, so my feel is that it's way past time for collaboration mm-hmm. at a bigger scale, at a bigger level, because everything we do here, yeah. it can resonate everywhere worldwide. Mm-hmm. It's just a function of, like you said, you know, as you get a little bit better technically, and you also hone in on the key things. I mean, I don't, because for example, if I watch a film like Get Out, mm-hmm. there's no special effects. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that really happened. It's just a great film. Well, cool. no, about Get Out, basically, to someone that really, if you watch Get Out, Get Out is basically a Nigerian story. Your in- in laws are doing it. Mm-hmm. Well, and not, that's what it is. Well, not quite. If you have been, I've been, I've been that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I've been. I've been, I've been Your white in laws are trying to ah, do it. <laughs> I've been the black guy, 17, going away for the weekend. And I girlfriend, hope I come back. girlfriend white. And they know other black people within 10 miles. I okay. hope I come back. Man, okay. let on, me this, on this laughing note, I believe we do need to. Okay, yes. Oh, God, Especially because we can even hear. The, the, yes, the cinema has started cinema working. Has started. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Thank sound. you very, very much. As I said, we like when I said that, that was painless. I was being <laughs> facetious about slightly, but about drinking from the well of knowledge. And I did not even know how that, much, how much it was going to be. So yeah. thank you very much for being very open and very. No, we don't thank our guests when they show up like this. <laughs> like this, but I think this, this was. No, I'm serious because, yeah. like, this was like because. So one Are of the things that the because yeah. no, 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 like so the sense of history. So like we spend a lot of time making stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And so we talk a lot of, about people's individual journeys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this weirdly, in my head, sparked a journey of a movement. Yeah. Believe me, he wants to cry. Movement. His eyes are tearing up. Yes, he's, he gets very, very. very he gets emotional. 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 Very, no, I good, rarely though. get emotional, but. And then when he does, now starts to cry. Uh, no, no, but I'm, but I'm in the sense that, like, <laughs> no, I'm in the sense that I don't know, like, there's a there's a thing about where you're coming from that is important mm-hmm. to get to where you're going. And you said it like, no matter, because one of the things about you see the inflection points and all of those things mm-hmm. and how industries change and evolve, mm-hmm. like, it's history, man. And I, thank you, I really appreciate it. Let me just no, let it that's a pleasure, man. I mean, you know, yeah. you guys set me up. <laughs> or oh, Zulu set me up, but I'm. What? I'm but here. um yeah, so let's just round up. So thank you guys <laughs> for watching IMG. Yes, thank you very much. And listening on all your favorite platforms. Peace and love. Merci Peace. beaucoup. <laughs>